I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Lyft gets $1 billion for its war chest in a new funding round with Alphabet leading the charge. Why the Google parent is riding shotgun with the startup in the race against Uber. Plus, Apple's iPhone plan comes under scrutiny after a report says the company slashes orders for the iPhone 8 by half. We'll put the strategy of launching two smartphones just weeks apart under the microscope. And Sundar Pichai's Google diplomacy as the company continues to face a series of political and cultural setbacks. How the CEO's multitasking skills are getting tested. But first, to our lead. Lyft gets new funding that values the ride-hailing service at $11 billion. And it is coming from an investor in its biggest rival. Alphabet's Capital G unit is leading the $1 billion investment. Remember, Alphabet's Google Ventures made a big investment in Uber years back. The deal also solidifies ties between Lyft and Alphabet's autonomous vehicle division, Waymo, which, of course, is embroiled in a bitter lawsuit with Uber. Joining us now to discuss Bloomberg Tech's Eric Newcomer, who covers all things ride-sharing, and our guest host for the hour, Bob O'Donnell, president of Technolysis Research. So, Eric, you reported a couple of months ago that this was yeah, possible. Right. Now it's official. What does this mean? I mean, I think it's, you know, it's amazing, uh, the sort of about face here on Alphabet. You know, they invested in... Uber back in 2013 when Uber was just doing black cars, they were way ahead of things, and that the relationship over these intervening years has totally deteriorated is amazing. I mean, and they also have a stake in Uber's success, right? I right, mean, if, right. if Uber has a you know massive exit, Alphabet would benefit from that greatly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I mean, you can see both sides of it. For one, it's good. I mean, clearly the industry is growing. Why not have stakes in both? On the other hand, it's a bit of a zero-sum game. I mean, the Uber and Lyft have traditionally used the money to spend it on subsidies against each other. So investing in both sides is sort of taking money out of your pockets and lighting it on fire because they keep using it to sort of discount their rides to, to gain market share. Bob, is it a zero-sum game? Well, I'm not sure that it is. I may disagree with Eric on this one because, look, it's still not completely ubiquitous. And so at the end of the day, any market grows when there are strong competitors, right? You can look at any kind of market there is. Two strong companies helps raise all boats, I would argue. Uh, certainly, there is a lot of that that's going on. But I think the opportunity to drive more uh, strength across it, make it more completely ubiquitous. Remember, we, we're in the bubble here. Outside the bubble, there's still a lot of people who haven't even tried it yet. So that's where the growth opportunities, I think, are, certainly here in the U.S. And then if Lyft takes some of that money and goes international, of course, that becomes a very interesting question as well. One of the things we seem to be seeing is no loyalty. I interviewed GM's president, Dan Ammon, earlier this week. GM, of course, made a huge investment in Lyft just a year ago. Um, now they're, they're partnering with Uber. Uh, take a listen to what he had to say when I asked if they'd ever consider buying Lyft or deepening their partnership with Lyft. A lot of options in terms of how we can go to market. We can go to market uh, you know, through our own uh, network capability. We can go to market through different partnerships. So I'd say all options are open at this time. So, Eric, no loyalty. <laughs> yeah, I think... I mean, what do you read into that? I think especially with self-driving cars, people want to be able to... Nobody knows who's going to win. Nobody knows what strengths they're going to bring to the table exactly. So I think everybody wants to have everything. And, you know, Alphabet's not putting all their chips in with Lyft. They have their own self-driving car platform. They're free to partner with other people. Lyft is partnering with a number, you know, they've partnered with Newtonomy, uh, Ford, you know, and obviously GM. So they, they have a lot of relationships of their own. So I think there's just a level of sort of cross-pollinating and invest, partnering with a lot of people. What concrete data do we have uh, on Lyft's progress in the U.S. market? Have they gained relative to Uber as Uber has been struggling? They've get, definitely gained market share in the U.S. We don't have exact numbers. Uh, it, you know, you sort of rely on third-party data collectors. It, mm -hmm. But anyway, but yeah, they've gained sort of how much I think we, we still need to see. And you think, Bob, it's perfectly feasible that there could be two big players. In Absolutely. I mean, I, again, it, you look at almost any market anywhere, I think that's critically important. And Eric's, you know, dead right on the autonomous driving thing. It is really early days. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows which direction this is going to go, and that's going to be a big challenge. So you've got to place your bets. Now, having said that, the concern I have is, look, the long-term play for both these guys is, you know what, 
eventually it's all going to be autonomous. Well, if this takes longer than people think, and I think it will, and all of a sudden you've given people employment for seven, eight, nine, ten years, it's going to be a lot harder to start pulling that back away. So ironically, I think there's going to be some big challenges down the road as people try and take the ultimate step in this business model. Eric, what's the latest in the Uber Waymo lawsuit? It's set to go to court in December, uh, sort of continuing. Uh, just, I mean, there was this huge release of data that U from the Straws Friedberg report, where basically Uber had sort of identified information that uh, Anthony Lewandowski had taken from Waymo, and that had been sort of very late in the game to disclose to Alphabet. So they're digging through all that, trying to make see see if that gives them any new evidence, and preparing for court in December. All right, Eric Newcomer, who covers Uber and Lyft for us. Uh, thanks so much, Bob O'Donnell. You are sticking with me. All right, the unlimited data plans Verizon once shunned are now helping the phone giant buy time for its next move. After unveiling an all-you-can-use data package, the largest U.S. wireless provider saw a surge in subscribers for a second straight quarter. The increase gives Verizon more breathing room to create big new sources of revenue in media, advertising, or connected cars as it struggles to maintain market share amid a price war. Relieved investors sent the shares up the most since July. Coming up, shares of Apple drop on signs that iPhone 8 demand isn't as strong as expected. We will dig in to what is fueling this Apple anxiety. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. The Dow and S&P 500 extended record highs on Thursday, but it was by the slimmest of margins as the session started in sell-off mode. A constant drag on the major averages was Apple down the most in two months. Joining us to break down why the shares fell, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abigail, this had to do with a report regarding Apple cutting orders to some of the suppliers. Splice it out for us. Indeed it did, Emily. There was a report from the Economic Daily News in Taiwan yesterday, late in the day, evening here uh, in the U.S., that basically said that Apple has cut orders for November and December relative to the iPhone 8 to its chip suppliers. That sent the shares not just of Apple lower, but also the suppliers. And it does have big reason to do with why uh, the U.S. major averages were sharply lower, especially earlier in this in the session uh, relative to those cuts it sounds as though it's model specific because some of these reports that come out of the Asian papers they're not necessarily written in stone I did speak to one analyst earlier today uh, Sean Harrison over at Longbow Research and he said he would do follow-up work to figure out whether or not this is true but if it is true it is one of the production cuts that typically comes in November or December this would be the first production cut in October since the iPhone 5c so it could be a bearish signal but again it seems like it's probably a model cut Cut, not an absolute cut and uh, some analysts are saying that the iPhone 7 is still selling very well even the iPhone 6 because the pricing relative to the iPhone 8 is that much better but of course Emily everybody's waiting for that iPhone 10 so we could have some consumers holding off for that and again going towards some of those cheaper models so the iPhone 8 right now it seems as though it's getting a bit squeezed. So, Abigail, there's little question that there's a lot of pressure on the iPhone 10 to perform well. People are waiting for it. But what are the risks? Well, you know, the biggest risk, Emily, probably is what if it turns out to be a dud? Everybody's expecting this phone to be great and that consumers are going to love it, that they're going to be willing to spend $1,000. But if the phone isn't as great as, as expected, it could also cause the ASPs or the average selling prices to go down, too. Now, historically, Apple uh, has complete inelasticity relative to pricing. They don't buy. But if this phone isn't selling, that could, in fact, uh, turn out to be a risk. Another risk, China. If we hop into the Bloomberg 
terminal and take a look at what's happening here with the financials. Now, on the left side, we see all the different revenue uh, segments, Americas, Asia Pacific, Europe, and so forth. Let's hone in on China, though, because China is about 16 percent of their overall revenue. And we see that between 2013 and 2015, orders revenue growth out of China, very, very big, helping to drive the company, helping to drive the stock. But more recently, over the last few quarters, it's been declining. And right now, reports are that the demand out of China is really pretty weak. That could be a worry. However, in China, the iPhone is really a status symbol. So most consumers there are probably waiting for that iPhone 10. But nonetheless, this could perhaps uh, be a point of worry. On the year, though, Emily, this stock, Apple, still up more than 30 percent. However, in an odd way, that in and of itself could be a bit of a risk. It tells us that investors, analysts, uh, strategists really have high expectations uh, for the iPhone 10 as to whether or not it's going to be the grand super cycle that everybody's looking for. And it also puts to some risk the December quarter, whether or not they'll hit numbers. Time will tell, but certainly today was a bit of a rocky day for Apple and some of those Apple suppliers. All right, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, thanks so much for weighing in. Uh, for more context now on Apple and the supply chain, still with us, Bob O'Donnell, president of Technolysis Research and our guest host for the hour. So first of all, this is a report that came out of the Taiwanese Economic Daily News. How reliable is a report like this? Well, look, coming out of Taiwan, rumors abound. Uh -huh. uh, having looked at that market for years and years and years, you know, things do pop up. Not every detail necessarily can be correct, but generally speaking, you do get a good sense of some of the things that happen in the supply chain through Taiwan. That's so where the it, ODMs is it, are. Is it conceivable to you that they could have cut orders by more than 50 percent? Well, again, the absolute 50 percent number does strike me as kind of high, mm -hmm. that they could cut orders by a, a good amount. My guess is it could be true. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, at the Apple event, this is something that we talked about, right? I had concerns around the fact that you've got a phone that a lot of people felt in the iPhone 8 was very similar to the 7 and the 6, and the 10 was much more interesting, more exciting, yet was going to be delayed. You know, I wrote a column about this for USA Today saying, hey, is the iPhone 8 going to suffer because of this? And it looks like that's exactly what's playing out. Now, Abigail used a word that I've never heard associated with an iPhone, but the potential that the iPhone 10 could be a dud. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I will disagree with Abigail on that one. I'm sure the iPhone 10 is going to do great. The question is, will there be enough supply? Remember that Q4 is always Apple's biggest quarter and they count on huge holiday sales. Well, guess what? It's coming out in November as it is. If there are supply chain hiccups there, that means all those people hoping for an iPhone 10 under the Christmas tree may not get it. That changes the dynamic there. And we could ironically see with the sale of the six and the seven that even though Apple introduced higher priced phones, their ASP actually goes down. Now, I know that seems totally counterintuitive, but if you do some math, iPhone 8 isn't selling, people are buying 6s and 7s, and not enough can get a 10. Mm -hmm. That's what could happen. It's not inconceivable. So have you heard any more about potential supply chain issues around the iPhone 10? Uh, look, because there's a concern that there won't be enough to meet demand. Well, there. I mean, I'm sure there won't be. I am sure that the demand is going to completely outstrip the supply. And again, that's my concern as well. That's why I said there's going to be a lot of people, they're not going to make it for a holiday purchase. That's going to impact their Q4 numbers for sure. And that whole notion of the super cycle, I think, gets delayed into 2018, uh, if not even later, because you know, it might be the second generation, the iPhone 10, before we see a super cycle. And then does this all smooth out middle of next year? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, look, it, it's Apple, right? Yeah. It's the iPhone. It's still an iconic thing. People are going to buy it. It's going to do well. There isn't a question, but it just gets delayed. The, the one question is serious, though, is China. Mm -hmm. You've got Huawei. You've got a stronger, a revived Xiaomi. You've got Oppo, Vivo. These brands, they're getting much stronger in China. And the differentiation between Apple and all these other guys is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And let's not forget Samsung. S8, Note 8 are doing very well for Samsung right now. All right, Bob O'Donnell, founder of Technalysis, you are sticking with me. Okay, coming up, MongoDB had a strong showing in its public debut. How the database software maker's CEO plans to stave off the likes of Amazon and Oracle next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
Intel posted strong earnings for the third quarter, driven by a surge in payments volume and growths on its mobile platform. Shares are up nearly 5% in late U.S. trading. PayPal also top forecast for revenue with a projection of $3.57 billion to $3.63 billion in the current quarter. Shares of PayPal have already soared more than 70% this year. MongoDB has marked its trading debut. The database software maker rose in earlier trading after pricing above the marketed range, raising $192 million. The IPO comes in what could be the biggest month of the year for U.S. listings. After a slow summer, it joins the 20 companies that have priced or are scheduled to price in October. Bloomberg's IPO reporter Alex Barinka caught up with MongoDB president and CEO Dave Itacheria. She started by asking how the company will use this new capital. It's actually all for working capital. We have no plans to make any acquisitions today. Um, we, we're going after a very, very large market. In fact, it's one of the largest markets in enterprise software. And uh, we're using the proceeds to really invest in both product and continue to innovate and produce uh, in, uh, new products as well as expand our existing portfolio products as well as invest in kind of go to market. You know, there's many parts of the world that we don't have salespeople in. Even in the U.S., we don't have salespeople in every NFL city. And so we're looking to expand our reach and uh, be able to reach more customers more efficiently. Who are you targeting as you continue to go for scale? You say you're pushing out geographically. Are there specific types of customers, developers, uh, IT partners? Who are you looking to build out the relationships with? Yeah, so we actually have over 4,300 customers today um, across nearly every vertical industry. So we have some of the largest customers in the world who are using MongoDB. So, uh, for example, over 50% of the top 100 companies in the world are, are customers of ours today. So some of the most sophisticated customers are using uh, MongoDB to run their business. And so one of the things that really differentiates MongoDB is that we're really a general purpose database that were designed uh, truly to address a wide variety of use cases and uh, across uh, almost every industry. So there's no revenue concentration. And um, uh, we feel like, you know, what it really shows is that uh, we are well positioned to go after larger opportunities. When you talk about larger opportunities, what's that mean? Bigger customers? Uh, break that down for me. So there's really three opportunities to grow in an account. One is you know, obviously their existing application grows as their data volumes grow. Um, new use cases, so we truly are a land and expand business. So we've seen customers grow by a factor of 10 and 20 times their initial spend. And so uh, as we penetrate the, the account and, and be able to support new applications, new use cases, and then migrations of existing use cases where they find that the existing application architecture just doesn't scale, it's hard to add new features, it's hard to adhere to new regulations or compliance policies that they have to conform to, that's usually a catalyst for them to migrate the existing application onto MongoDB. So with that, you know, these accounts are growing very quickly and we're adding lots of new accounts as well. And so that's why we feel very bullish about our future. When I do think about the industry, though, uh, the competition names like Oracle come to mind. Apple, uh, Amazon, and Google are cross-selling their database products on their cloud offerings, and that's a semi-recent development. How do you jockey against these biggest names in tech uh, when it comes to selling into customers? Yes, uh, good question. We actually, well, you know, we've been competing with the biggest names in tech since the company was founded. And so Oracle has built its database technology on an architecture that was introduced over 40 years ago. I mean, 40 years ago, I was using a rotary phone to make phone calls. Now I have a computer in my pocket. So fundamentally, the technology landscape has changed pretty radically, but their architecture is still based on the relational database, which was introduced you know, in the 1970s. Uh, in terms of the other players like Amazon and Google, we're actually partners with them. They've actually helped fund the growth of some of our products on their cloud. Um, but one of the advantages that we have is you can literally run MongoDB anywhere. You can run it on premise, literally on your laptop. You can run it in the data center and you can run it in the, in the private or public clouds. So Dave, I, ha I have to ask, talking to my sources on the street, uh, some did kind of wonder, uh, what is the value of MongoDB uh, in staying a standalone company? What if one of these bigger players does come in and scoop you all up? Are you a better uh, product within a larger suite? What is the argument for MongoDB to be a standalone and not uh, a uh, ideal acquisition target? 
No, we, we've been building this company for the last 10 years. I mean, we've acquired, as I said, over 4,000 customers. We've proven that we can serve the needs of the most demanding customers. Well, not just customers in, in North America, but customers in Europe and also Asia. And so we feel very, very comfortable about uh, being a standalone entity. Now with the proceeds from the IPO, we have a very uh, strong balance sheet to continue to invest in the business. And, and I think uh, that investors kind of have, have, have recognized that and, and obviously rewarded us for that. And, and, and I also should point out, it's not about how the stock is doing today, it's about long term. And we believe that, that the best is yet to come. That was MongoDB President and CEO Dave Itacheria. Coming up, we take a look at Lyft's mega funding round through the lens of an investor. Fontanella's special venture partner, Gabe Klein, joins us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Now, back to our top story of the day, Lyft's blockbuster funding round. The ride-hailing company pulling in $1 billion, led by Alphabet's growth investment arm, capital G. The funding could be used to enhance the ride-hailing startup's footprint in both the U.S. and abroad. And it's a shot across the bow at Uber, Lyft's biggest rival. Joining us now to discuss from Washington, Fontanella special venture partner and Cityfy co-founder Gabe Klein. Klein was also commissioner of transportation in Chicago and Washington, D.C. Bob O'Donnell, founder of Technalysis, also still with us. Gabe, you are a Lyft investor. What does this mean from an investor's perspective who's already a stakeholder in the company? Well, it's a wonderful day, and I think, really, Emily, it's, it's total validation. You know, when you have a mission-driven uh, approach, when you're ethical and you work with cities, um, this is what happens. And, you know, I remember being on here just a couple years ago when Uber announced that they were going to build their own self-driving cars, and I remember, you know, it was sort of this bombshell, and, and you're asking me, you know, what do you think? Is this sort of like, not the end for Lyft, but th is this going to be something that's insurmountable? And I remember saying, you know what? I think they should focus, and they are focusing on customer service, uh, uh, quality of relationships with their drivers, and growing the U.S. market. And they've done a fantastic job. They've executed, they've fired on all cylinders, and this is the reward. And now they cover 95% of the country. That said, you know, Lyft is still, the valuation is what, like, you know, one-seventh of what, yeah. what Uber's is? And yeah. we're still looking for concrete data on how much Lyft has advanced in this period where we've seen Uber struggle. Do you have any information on that? Well, I mean, I think, look, they've hit 500 million rides. They've, they've almost doubled their footprint in just this last year. Uh, and my prediction is that they will be the first uh, transportation network company or ride hailing company to be profitable. You know, I, I think while scale is important, and obviously in Silicon Valley, everybody uh, prides himself on growing fast and scale, but I think the quality of the service, the quality of the execution, the quality of the company make a big difference. This is a long game, not a short game. And when somebody like Capital G puts a billion dollars into this, spreads their bets out, um, I think you know that um, they understand it's going to be a very big market, lots of players, particularly with autonomous vehicles coming, and, uh, and this is a long game, not a short bet. Hey, Gabe, Bob O'Donnell here. Uh, so with that billion dollars, do you think it's better spent in the U.S., or do they start to think internationally? Well, look, I don't want to speak for, for Logan and John, who are obviously experts at what they do. They're, they're doing a phenomenal job. But um, I think there's a lot of growing to be done in the existing cities. And I think also you have Canada right next door. Um, you got Mexico City. So, you know, you can stay on the continent and start to really spread your wings. But I think what Uber's learned, you know, from the experience over in China with, with Didi, and I'm not saying it didn't end well for them overall, but um, they had to pull out and they had to do a deal. And, you know, I think sometimes taking it slow, letting the market m mature following instead of leading in foreign markets can be smart or having partnerships. At the same time, Gabe, that we've seen Alphabet, I guess you could say, stab Uber in the back <laughs> in doing this. We're also seeing GM, which was a big investor in Lyft, doing the same thing. You know, their division, yeah. Cruise Automation, is in talks with Uber to provide self-driving cars. I asked the president of GM earlier this week, would they ever consider deepening their partnership with Lyft? He was very vague and said all options are still on the table. So, you know, what do you make that another Lyft investor is also playing both sides of the table. 
Well, again, when I was on a couple years ago and you asked me about uh, Uber, you know, creating their, their own self-driving car, you know, I, I was thinking, why would you do that when you can be agnostic and your expertise is in providing an excellent service in cities and somebody else's expertise is in engineering and building cars? And I think that's exactly what Lyft has done, right? And they've partnered with basically everybody and anybody that's got a great quality product. And I think you're going to see a lot of these sort of frenemy type situations where you have companies that compete in some areas and they collaborate in other areas. So just because Google put in a bill or led a billion dollar round today doesn't mean that they're not going to do business with Chrysler, Fiat and a host of of other companies on the OEM side and on the service side. So I actually think that um, that this is healthy. I want I think we want to create as much uh, competition as possible in these markets, and that's what's happening. So, but on the autonomous car side, I guess one of the questions is how far do these platforms need to go on their own? In other words, do they really need to have some of their own technology, or can they completely rely on partners? Because it seems to me that depending on how the, the network is built and the services are built, some of that IP essentially is going to have to come from the lifts of the world. Sure. Look, I wouldn't be surprised if Uber had some of their own vehicles, you know, built through OEM partners, same with Lyft, um, but they also supplemented, you know. Um, you know, one of the things that I think went wrong with the Lyft-GM partnership, not that anything went wrong per se, but I don't know that GM could keep up with the supply needed of vehicles. Um, you know, the, they're at 0.5 percent. Um, of, of the population is really using these services actively. So it's going to grow and grow and grow. And so um, I think part of Lyft's strategy is it, it's not that we want to have one partner or another. It's that we have to have many partners because the business is going to continue to grow dramatically over the next decade. Now, uh, Chris Saka, an early Uber investor, Gabe, told me he thinks ride sharing is a zero sum game and that there's no way Uber doesn't yep. win out. Bob earlier was saying this is not a zero sum game. I, I assume you, you, you might espouse the same logic. How, how, how do you see Lyft coming back? I mean, do you see a market where it's 50 50? Do you see uh, a market where Lyft could subsume uh, all the traffic? Oh, look, it's going to get much more interesting. Bob's right, by the way. Um, this is not going to be a winner-takes-all game. Cities are complicated. I've worked with hundreds of cities. I've worked in cities. I've been on the private side at Zipcar with cities. Look, um, it's going to evolve. Uh, different cities are going to want to have different arrangements in terms of concessions for autonomous vehicle service versus a completely free market. Some may run their own services. Um, and look, you've got new services coming up. Bike share. You know, I started the bike share systems here in DC and Chicago uh, that are dock systems owned by the city. But these new dockless systems like Spin are coming along. And um, to be honest, some of the trips that people are taking in Uber and Lyft can be taken on an electric bike or on a Spin bike share bike. So I think it's going to get more interesting. And the single occupancy vehicle still owns the market. So all of these guys can do extremely well, uh, Lyft, Uber, Spin, you know, and on and on. Um, so I'm extremely bullish on the whole segment, on mobility as a service, uh, you know, versus people buying their own cars. That's the future. All right. Gabe Klein, co-founder at CityFi, special venture partner at Fontanellis. Thank you, Gabe, as always, for joining us. Uh, Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis, you are sticking Thank with you. me. Thank you. All right, Amazon will close the bidding process for its second headquarters end of day Thursday. The e-commerce giant plans to invest more than $5 billion and hire 50,000 people at its second headquarters. Over 100 cities have expressed interest in making a run for the prestige of being home to the company's HQ2. The site announcement will be revealed in 2018. Coming up, it's been two years since Sundar Pichai took the top spot at Google. How he feels about the role and what's to come for the tech giant. This is Bloomberg. U.S. businesses and the tech sector especially continue to invest in wind and solar energy. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos today christened the 253 megawatt Amazon wind farm in Texas. The company has bought more than 1.22 gigawatts of output to date from U.S. clean energy projects, second only to Google. Bloomberg New Energy Finance reports that corporations agreed to buy under 2 gigawatts of clean power in the U.S. this year and is on track to match the 2.6 gigawatts signed last year. 
Well, big tech companies have been taking the heat on a number of issues over the last year. Take Google, for example. CEO Sundar Pichai has had to deal with staff protests over the president's immigration policy, a prolonged standoff with advertisers over disturbing content on YouTube, a record regulatory fine from the EU, and debates about gender equality, just to name a few. Pichai sat down with us for an exclusive interview with Bloomberg Businessweek, spoke to Bloomberg Tech's Brad Stone and Mark Bergen, who joins us now, and still with us, Bob O'Donnell, Technologist Research President and our guest host for the hour. So, you know, it's two years into the job, Mark. Uh, Sundar, the headline was something along the lines of everyone's mad at Google and Sundar Pichai has to fix it. How is he handling all of these issues? You know, so Sundar was a product and he still considers himself a sort of a product first person and that's been his, his you know, the big push he's had at Google has been getting AI and machine learning into all their products. I think he has been sort of, you know, these unexpected issues. He didn't expect Trump necessarily, a lot of the immigration issues, the YouTube boycott. Um, I think he's been handling it with kind of a combination of delegation. Right, he delegated the YouTube issue to a lot of his top business people. Um, the policy stuff has gone to Kent Walker, the general counsel. Uh, we found out today is going to be one testifying before Congress. Uh, and he's also done this, you know, Sundar's tactic has been deliberate. Uh, he likes to get people, he likes to build consensus. He likes to get people in a room. Um, so I think it's been a lot of these issues. He's, he's gone and he's sought, sought counsel with his management uh, as well as outside of Google. As you mentioned, Google's one of their top lawyers, Kent Walker, will be testifying mm -hmm. before Congress on this issue of Russian meddling. Uh, there's also concerns about fake news. What did he have to say about Google's responsibility? You know, he said, he said that we make mistakes and we make mistakes. It's very public. Uh, I think he really, fake news is a really interesting uh, issue for them. And the first thing he said to us was, you know, we see this as Google was founded as a search quality company, uh, PageRank, which is the algorithm that started off Google was a search quality issue. And they see fake news as, as a search problem. They see it similar to how they've addressed spam for the past almost 20 years, uh, which I think is an interesting framing. And, and for them, you know, they're, they're seeing this as almost like, well, we, we, address, we address spam bots and we're still battling them. So we can, we can think about this uh, with, with fake news too. You know, the fascinating thing I think about Google is they are the classic Silicon Valley engineering driven company, right? Mm -hmm. And all of the negativity that's being associated with that I think is really hitting them fairly or unfairly. Mm -hmm. um, but it does raise some questions about how do they move forward? I mean, I feel like there's so much, uh, li or so little I should say, real thinking about the human issues. How do these things impact people? And things a lot about privacy and tracking and all that kind of stuff feels like they really need to drive more of that. Do you get a sense that they're trying to address those issues to, to maintain trust? I, you know, I think Sundar as CEO is sort of signals, he, I, he wouldn't call himself an engineer, he called himself a product person, right? And, and you can debate that, but, but I, <laughs> I think that they, you know, example they put out this uh, with their last, earlier this month with their hardware, uh, the, the one of the interesting, Components was or new new uh, devices was something called Clips, which right. is a camera. Uh, they've been working on it internally for a long time and thought about whether it could be something like Google Glass you wear on your head or something you wear like a wearable. They right. intentionally created it to be incredibly privacy first, and yet as soon as it came out, people responded, "Well, here's Google's another way to, to spy right. on you." Well, and the interesting thing about that product actually, it's actually Intel Movidius chip-driven technology there, mm -hmm. but. You know, and it's a fascinating thing, but we were, we were chatting beforehand about, you know, Elon Musk says, oh, this is bad, you know, uh, inherently because of the AI thing. And I feel like, well, it's a lot for him to say. He puts out cars that, you know, call, he calls it autopilot. That's a lot more dangerous than the AI that Google's doing. Yeah, we had an interesting discussion which didn't make it the story about um, the Echo and Google Home, right? So Google was second to uh, put out their speaker. Um, after Amazon, a lot of people in the Valley, people inside of Google have criticized them for being kind of slow. Uh, and you know, Sundar is, uh, by his nature, very deliberate and maybe more conservative than the prior CEOs. You know, what he told us about the Echo was that they actually have a, so Google has a very high bar for voice technology, and he thought that it didn't meet their bar yet, and that was part of the reason that they were kind of second to market. Last quick question: James Damore, the engineer who was fired for this memo that he sent, arguing that men and women have biological differences when it comes to engineering and and, and leadership positions. The New York Times, uh, David Brooks had a column that said Sundar Pichai should be fired, yeah. essentially for firing James Damore. Yeah. What did Sundar have to say about all that? He said he, you know, this he said. There are two values, fundamental values that the company cherishes coming to conflict, right? This is free speech meeting with um, the issues that it really 
ticked off a lot of people at the company, and I think a lot of people in management, a lot of people at the board. Um, he did take the issue to, to John Hennessy, the former president of Stanford, who's on Google Alphabet board, um, who's dealt with similar issues around Stanford. Uh, Google, or Sundar did tell us that this was an issue he made uh, for the company. And this was a company decision, and he was aware there would be consequences outside the company, but he made it for, he thought, when, And in, was it his decision, or did Larry Page? It was his decision, yeah. All right. Mark Bergen, uh, who covers Google for Bloomberg Tech. Thank you so much, Bob. You are sticking with me. All right, that, that story in the latest issue of Bloomberg Business Week on newsstands online and in the App Store. And you can hear more from the magazine's reporters and editors every Saturday and Sunday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Coming up, Twitter is making a major push to halt harassment on its platform, but is it too little too late? We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Twitter says it's introducing new policies to combat harassment and unwanted sexual advances. The social media giant said it will immediately and permanently suspend any account that clearly harasses someone or posts nude images without the consent of the subject. The move comes amid a recent decision by Twitter to disable the account of actress Rose McGowan, who used the platform to name harassers in the entertainment industry. Joining us now to discuss our Bloomberg Tech reporter, Sarah Fryer, and our guest host for the hour, Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis. So <laughs> the, the, the word clearly is, is, is at issue here because it's unclear what their policies actually are. Yeah, Twitter has been very vague in the past, and in one of the main things that Dorsey wants to fix with these new rules is to have a little bit more standardization in, in terms of how they actually approach these situations. Uh, Rose McGowan, when she was suspended, it was for posting an email that had a phone number in it. Um, other people have been not suspended for things that are much worse. Mm -hmm. So that's the question. How are they going to apply these policies in a way that sounds more equitable? So, you know, Jack Dorsey has said over the last few days they're going to be more transparent. Do we actually have that transparency yet? Do we know what they're doing? Do we know uh, how they're thinking about this? Well, we know that they're going to get a lot harder on sexual uh, harassment, especially people sending the nude images, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, what we don't know is, is exactly how these policies will evolve. Jack talked about the fact that they have this this trust and safety council that they've been working with since last year that they work with on uh, the particulars of the changes they're trying to make and they're still in the draft stages. We don't have the clarity on what the final rules will be. Bob, is it too little, too late? Well, I mean, look, there are so many challenges with all these social media platforms. I know it's sort of basic, but the fact that we're still in a world where you have anonymous accounts, that's it's going to always be an issue and no matter what you do it's going to be very difficult to overcome those kinds of things right I, I mean I just feel like there needs to be a recognition that these tools a can be used for bad purposes which I think they finally realized but really got caught off guard by and need to be very proactive about doing that and they also need to think about the fact that there's no way they're ever going to be a neutral platform so accept that fact and then build things around that and just know that look this is not always going to be neutral we have to take sides and that's just the way it is and if people don't like it then they can leave but are they really going to do that I mean free speech is is you know one of the core values it's of this been a company core but the problem is that when other people feel they are being silenced by harassers it, it means not everyone is speaking freely. Absolutely, and, and the problem, especially for Twitter, that people aren't talking about is how do you really implement this well internationally? Mm -hmm. Most of their users are outside the U.S., and it does, it's not clear to me that they have a, a very good understanding of the cultural nuances of harassment in different places. The linguistic and, nuances. Yes, exactly. This is, this is a very difficult issue, and at this time, they have to have humans trained to prevent these things from getting worse um, but it, the training is very hard and they've been working on it for years uh, but they you know even though they said they prioritized it I think it was like last year around this time that they started doing that things have seemingly gotten more to become more of a handful right. than they were you know it's it's important to point out you know we've seen the me too campaign you know with women and revealing that they have been sexually harassed take off on Facebook and Twitter and it's you know an interesting example about how these platforms can be used for good just as easily as they can be used for bad 
right? And you know, you know, it, you know, you wonder how how the company can balance all of this, given that it's all traffic, right? Well, I mean, it is all traffic, and of course, there there can be good, and there can be, there is going to be bad. But you know, the problem was it felt like, and it still feels like, they don't really know how to deal with the bad, and I, it's not an easy problem. And I, you know, I would never would want to say that they should limit free speech, but at the same time, there have to be rules, right? Just because you say certain things are not allowed doesn't mean you're anti-free speech, right? There's still rules and regulations you have to figure out that are common sense. All right. Well, uh, obviously, this. Is a continuing story on Osari. You're going to continue to follow this story. Bob O'Donnell of Technolysis, thanks for having, thank joining us on the show as our guest thanks host, Sarah Fryer. <laughs> as always, thank you as well. A quick disclosure, Bloomberg LP is developing a global breaking news network for Twitter. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.